So yesterday we talked about the fact that we're going to be talking about current electronics, and we did a few things with just the basics of what current electronics is about. Today we're going to do the overview. There's basically, there's three parts to this discussion, four parts to this discussion, or this unit. You know, the first is what we're going to see here, uh, you know, current electronics, like what current is. There's simple circuits in Ohm's law. There's RC circuits. And then there's, I guess I can't count either. There's not really an order to this. I've tried it a bunch of different ways. I've tried doing the microscopic theoretical basis for where current comes from and building up on that. I found this, most students don't really appreciate that too much. Um, and it's actually kind of, of, of challenging some of the math behind it. Um, you can't do this one without doing that one first. So we will start here with just basic current electronics, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's rules. We've already done Kirchhoff's rules for capacitors, but we're going to talk about Kirchhoff's rules for resistors. But we have to start with a similar kind of theory as we did for capacitors. Now, capacitors we defined based on their properties. I, I can't do that with resistors. Not in the same way, at least, because to understand what a resistor is doing, you do have to understand what the, the microscopic view of current is. So instead, we're going to start with a simple circuit, just a voltage supply, a resistor, and a single switch. And if you'll recall with capacitors, we defined capacitance in terms of charge and voltage. And we later kind of showed that capacitance could be related to the size and shape of our device. For resistors, we're going to do something similar, except for resistors, we have a theoretical definition of current already, which is the flow of charged particles, right, dQ dt. However, in practice, we seldom get to use this, this uh, definition of current because to use that definition of current, we need to know something about the flow of charged particles. There is a a better way for us to deal with current. And by better, I mean there's at least a more pragmatic and simple way to deal with current. And that's something known as Ohm's law. Ohm's law is a simple relationship. However, <laughs> before I get into it too much, I'm going to tell you that it's a simple relationship, but there's a certain amount of complexity that's going to be left out of this conversation completely. I will have to address a little bit of that at the onset. But Ohm's law is a relationship between current, voltage, and resistance. I write it like this on purpose, even though anybody who's had even a, even a, a middle school like course in electronics probably learned that Ohm's law was V equals IR. Um, this is the correct way for you guys to have it in your notes. I know it sounds stupid, like, well, they're the same, Mr. Shelton. Um, no. Voltage exists without there being a circuit. A power supply has a vo potential difference. So it exists apart from the circuit. And resistance exists apart from a circuit. These two things are independent. So you can have a battery, you can have a resistor, you can have a pile of resistors. Current only exists in combination with the circuit. It only exists when the circuit is connected. Current is drawn from the battery based on the voltage and the resistance. So I want to be really clear. This is purely dependent on these two. This is the dependent relationship with I being completely dependent upon the voltage and the resistance. So to understand this, you have to kind of understand what resistance is. And it's not particularly hard. I mean, the word kind of tells you. But resistance is anything 
that impedes the flow of charge. A resistor is still a conductor. It will still allow charge to pass through it, but it doesn't do so easily. It puts up an impediment to the flow of charge. The larger the resistance, the more it attempts to impede the flow of charge. So as you can probably understand, resistance is a value that can go from zero to infinity. Infinite resistance is no connection at all. So opening the switch presents infinite resistance because there'll be no flow of current. More interesting is that we actually do have things called superconductors, which offer zero resistance to the flow of charged particles. They present some unique possibilities for what can be done with electronics, but often putting in a zero for R obviously gives you some weird results, right? Just Ohm's law on its own suggests that if you have a superconductor and you're connected to a battery, you would suddenly have infinite current. That's not how electronics works. Just, just be aware, there is no infinite current. This is one of those cases where, you know, I can't just point to infinity. There won't be infinite current. You don't put zero in for resistance. There's always some resistance somewhere. So we'll talk about the other places where resistance shows up, but all voltage supplies are what we call current limited. They provide a maximum amount of current. If you try to exceed that, you get nothing more. So a six volt battery, which can provide lots of current, will be current limited to about two to three amps at its best. Now, we'll come to what that actually means in practice. But for today, we're just going to take a look at some simple circuits like these. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't at least talk a little bit about units here before we get started and what Ohm's law is actually about. So let's have a few moments to talk about Ohm's law and a little bit about resistance and such. First, Ohm's law is a pretty simple relationship, as you can see. But there are some things about Ohm's law that you need to understand. Ohm's law is true for ohmic devices. Now, a shrewd student should have a question for me. Yes, sir? I'm so glad you asked. An ohmic device is a device that obeys Ohm's law. Oh. <laughs> Ridiculous, right? The problem is that most devices aren't ohmic. A capacitor is not an ohmic device. I Meaning if you connect a capacitor to a battery, it will not draw current in a linear function like this one. So it's not an ohmic device. A diode is not an ohmic device. There are, are a group of materials that obey Ohm's law. Um, carbon obeys Ohm's law. In fact, most resistors that we're going to use are just carbon-based resistors. They're a small package of carbon with wires inside of them dipped in wax so that the carbon stays together. They are simple ohmic devices. But all devices that obey Ohm's law only obey it for a limited range, meaning ohmic devices are ohmic usually for a small range of potential currents. So light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs, they're ohmic. They will obey Ohm's law for a narrow range of, of narrow range of currents. The carbon resistors we're going to use, they'll obey Ohm's law for a narrow range of currents. But all ohmic devices will eventually break down, meaning you can put enough current in them where they stop obeying Ohm's law. Usually it's because of temperature. The material starts to get hot and its properties start to change the ability of electrons to go through it becomes more impeded as it gets hot. For carbon resistors, they'll just catch fire or blow up or pop. For incandescent bulbs, the tungsten will just burn out. So when you start reaching some of these limits, they stop obeying Ohm's law. Like a light bulb obeys Ohm's law until it starts emitting light. And once it starts emitting light, it generally is hot enough where it's no longer obeying Ohm's law anymore. So although we say that a light bulb obeys Ohm's law, Truthfully, most devices are only ohmic for a very narrow range of applied currents. <sighs> Yesterday, I did some defining of units. I want to continue that. 
we measure voltage in volts and current in amps. Now, we probably should go through this little route, shouldn't we? Get it all the way down to kilograms, coulombs, meters, and seconds. And by we, I mean you. You should do it. You can do it. You're smart people. Allie just gave me that look like I don't want to do it. But I'm still going to say you can do it. Try it. Because that's one of the uh, letters of recommendation I filled out today. I'm not sure. I don't care. I got joules kg over m squared on the top. You got kg over m squared on the top. And what else? And then joules? <sighs> Luckily, after you submit on Common App, you can go and unsubmit and make changes of top 5%, top of all students, top 10%, the middle, satisfactory, they have a heartbeat. It's a, it's a range of things you're allowed to say. Top is um, joules per coulomb, right? And yesterday I gave you amps, so it should be fresh in your notes. Like you just turned to the day before to find that it's coulombs per second. All right, dq dt, which I wrote just a minute ago. Uh. Now, joule, I get. That, that one's complicated. That's, you know, meter, newton, drop that coulomb to the bottom, coulomb squared per second. Newton's kind of tough, right? All those things inside there. So kilograms, meters per second squared, all divided by coulomb squared per second. Now we're getting somewhere, right? Um, I think we could probably finish this up by having a kilogram meter squared per coulomb squared second. That tells you absolutely nothing, doesn't it? I mean, I, I love when you finally get down to these bare ones. It just says nothing. I think they stop meaning something after kilogram meter per second squared because they end up looking just like this. I, where's the meter part? You know what I mean? Somewhere inside this measurement for resistance with current and voltage and all that, there's meters and seconds. I get the seconds part. The meters part and the kilograms part, whew. but it's there. What's interesting is that it's there. The electrons have what's called a mean free path. It's how far the average electron travels before having a collision with an atom. And this determines what's called the drift velocity of the electrons through the wire, meters per second, which is definitely hampered by their own inertia, kilograms. All of that ends up being inside our measurement here. So the meters per second, not accidental. That's going to be due to drift velocity. Meters, mean free path, which determines how long it takes for that electron to move, which is part of that coulombs per second thing that's going on there and the fact that their mass plays a role in how fast they can move under the action of an electric field. That's why those things end up being there. It's all gonna be based on those physical parameters. It just doesn't look like it when you look at this. So we'll see this when we look at the microscopic level, why it breaks down to this. But here's the best part. Volts per amp, way back here, has been given a name, it's called ohms. We measure resistance in ohms a volt per amp. More interesting, we use a symbol for ohms, which is the Greek letter omega. Capital omega, I think. Or, as you'll probably end up saying, the horseshoe. But Greek letter omega. So, uh, all of that, just to talk about the units. Let's go back to Ohm's law and a simple circuit. When you close the switch, you complete a pathway from one side of the potential difference to the other. If it is a full conducting pathway, you will draw current from the battery. The amount of current that you draw from the battery is proportional to the voltage and the resistance. Resistance is exactly what it sounds. It attempts to impede the flow of current. So obviously if resistance increases, you get less current. But voltage is the pressure that pushes the charges through the wire. 
So if you have more voltage, you would expect to have more current. All that make perfect sense? So Ohm's law. The reason why I do that is we're gonna do some work with Kirchhoff's rules. And we're gonna look at our first circuit. All right, simple circuit, two resistors in series. When you close the switch, you draw current from the battery. What a lot of people don't fully appreciate is that the moment the switch is closed, a current is established everywhere in the system at once. A lot of people think that when I say you have to draw current from the battery, like the current starts here, and begins its path around the battery. That's not true. The moment the switch is closed, all the charges in the circuit move at once. This isn't violating any kind of rules of like faster than light travel. The reason why all of the charges move at once is you have to think about this as being a wire that is filled with charged particles. And they are as close together as they can be without being on top of each other and also occupying each other's space. Imagine a, a hose that is filled with small pebbles. They would all be right next to each other, correct? You follow what I'm saying with the hose? If I shove one more pebble in the hose, they all shift at once because they're all in contact. This is what happens inside a circuit. You close the switch, everything experiences the electric field at once and all the charges move at the same moment. Now, you may not reach what's called a steady state condition right away. It may take time to reach your steady state condition and there are things that would affect that but they all begin moving at once. So everywhere in the wire, we establish a current at once. Now the properties that affect how long it takes for our circuit to get up to its full current, its steady state current, aren't arbitrary. There are properties of a battery that might take time for it to establish its steady state current in the wire. We are not gonna study those this year. We will study what's called internal resistance. It has a, some, a part to play in this. It's something that has to do with the battery. But we're not gonna talk about the, the rate of acid reduction that's going on in the battery that could contribute to the steady state current. We will talk about how capacitance has a huge impact on how long it takes to reach a steady state current. Those are the things that we'll talk about that affect it. For the time being, I'm gonna focus just on what's considered a simple and ideal circuit. Ideal circuits have the following characteristics. First, they have perfect batteries. A perfect battery has zero internal resistance. That means a perfect battery gives you the exact amount of current for your arrangement and can provide unlimited current. Not to be confused with a real battery. I'll say that again, almost all of our resistor discussions will always be real resistors, which obey Ohm's law through all current ranges. That will not be true about voltage supplies and things that are used to measure voltage and current. You will have to be very aware of the difference between um, real and ideal batteries, real and ideal voltmeters, and real and ideal current meters. So I will delineate them as often as possible. And the first one are batteries. Real batteries have internal resistance. This limits the current output of a battery. Real batteries have internal resistance. This limits the current output of a battery. Ideal batteries have no such limit. Real wires have resistance. Ideal wires do not. We will assume that all wires are ideal. And any resistance in a wire 
will be taken up by the resistors that are in your circuit. That's not actually a, a huge stretch. Most copper wire has such low internal resistance that it's within the error range of your resistors. So making this claim isn't huge. But batteries aren't like that. The six volt batteries we have, they have a pretty easy to measure internal resistance. And trust me, their internal resistance is the lowest of all the batteries. We start dealing with things like double A's and triple A's, they have a very high internal resistance. So the six volts I use specifically because they have very low internal resistance. They're closer to ideal than any other battery we're gonna use in here. All right, back to this. Close the switch and let's talk about Kirchhoff's laws. So when I close the switch, I will point out that I have one complete loop in this switch. So I can generate one relationship from the resistors that I have in this circuit. If you remember what Kirchhoff's first law is, it says that I add up the sum of all the voltage drops and I set it equal to zero for any closed loop in the circuit. I have a single closed loop in the circuit. So I have V for my battery, and then I have a voltage drop across resistor one and a voltage drop across resistor two. Now, if you remember, we did something really similar with capacitors, right? One of the first things we did is we put in for the voltage drop an expression that talked about how the voltage actually dropped when passing through a circuit. For us, that's gonna be Ohm's law. In the last one, we used the definition of capacitor. So I'm gonna take this, solve it for V, and say that V1 equals IR1, well, I1, R1, and V2, equals I2, R2. So, quick uh, substitution. Now this doesn't tell us very much until we apply Kirchhoff's second law. Kirchhoff's second law says that the current into any junction has to equal the current out. I see no place where the current gets separated or divided, do you? So the current into this point in the circuit has to be equal to the current into this point in the circuit because there's no place for the current to split. You follow me? That suggests that I1 must equal I2. which I'm just gonna set equal to I in the battery. I know you don't know where I'm going yet, but it'll be very clear in less than 60 seconds. Let's bring these two ideas together, shall we? V minus I in the battery times R1 minus I in the battery times R2 equals zero. V equals I in the battery times R1 plus R2. V divided by I in the battery equals R1 plus R2. If you don't see where I'm going with this, remember V equals IR. What I've just found is the resistance presented to the battery. In fact, the battery doesn't know what's connected to it. It doesn't know if there's one resistor or a hundred resistors. This represents the resistance presented to the battery. You'll notice it's the sum of the resistors in series. That's because when you have resistors in series, you can replace them with an equivalent resistance that is equal to the sum of the resistors. Do we do that with capacitors? Not exactly, right? 
This would be what we would do for capacitors in parallel, but resistors in series we add together. You get that you're going to have to keep that straight, right? So, thing number one, the equivalent resistance for series circuits is the sum of the individual resistors in series. Commit that to memory. It's on the equation sheet. Commit it to memory. You need it fast. So you probably know where I'm going to go next, but in case you don't, um, we probably need to learn how to solve simple, simple series circuits. He's in all agreement. So I would like you to see if you can do this without me since you've done circuits before. Let's put three resistors in series. Let's have a three ohm resistor, a six ohm resistor, and a nine ohm resistor, and a six volt battery. If I want to solve this system, that would be finding the voltage and current through every resistor. Not too terrible. Um, you kind of know what to do here. We will use stepwise reduction. And I think we can reduce this circuit in one step. You guys remember stepwise reduction, right? So 12 ohms, six volts. Okay, good, just making sure. Just making sure. So we are paying attention. Good, 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 good. How much current must that be? You're smarties. Can you do it? I know I'm going a little fast, but this is almost the exact same thing we did before. Yeah, Ohm's law. Right? Current equals voltage divided by resistance. So 6 over 18, 1 third, and it's of an amp. 1 third amp. Just an A. Now, remember how capacitors in series all had the same charge? What do you think the equivalent value for charge is in a resistor circuit? It's current. Current is a similar, I mean, charge and current are related, right? I mean, current is the flow of charged particles. So if capacitors in series all had the same amount of charge, resistors in series all have the same current. There's also no breaks in the circuit, so Kirchhoff's law also supports that. So when I'm doing stepwise reduction and I step backwards, I apply the same current to all resistors that are in series. I took the time to write that out. Don't be the first person to screw this up when we do these and I come to your paper and you don't know what to do. So one third of an amp, one third of an amp, one third of an amp. Voltage is current times resistance. Just take that, turn it around and solve for V. Third times three, one volt. Third times six, two volts. Third times nine, three volts. Do they equal six when you add them all up? Solving a circuit, pretty straightforward, guys. Um, I hate to add something to this, but remember, capacitors stored energy. Resistors don't store energy. Resistors consume energy. It's a little different. 
With a capacitor, we can put energy in the capacitor and get it back out. But as the resistor has current passing through it, those electrons are delivering energy through collision to atoms inside the resistor. Resistors get hot, so they consume energy. That heat can be of use. If it's a light bulb, the heat causes the light bulb to glow. So incandescent bulbs give away light purely because of that process. The electrons causing collisions, making the material, the tungsten, get hot, and then that heated material glows due to black body radiation. Now, just a straightforward resistor, it's just out there getting hot. It's a heating element. Your stove is a heating element. It doesn't get as hot as a light bulb. That's why it doesn't glow as brightly. But there's a lot more of it, so there's a lot more energy being given off. Don't assume brightness and amount of energy being given off are the same thing. No, they're not directly related. They're related. They're not directly related. So we call this power, the rate at which energy is consumed. call this powers, the rate at which energy is consumed. If you multiply voltage and current together, you will get a joule per second. So the unit here is the watt, which is a joule per second. So capacitors stored energy, joules. Resistors consume that energy. And the rate at which they do so is a product of the voltage and the current. But you, being smart students, should realize there's probably two other ways we could calculate power. You've got 30 seconds to discover them, and then somebody here who I called on last time gets to redeem themselves by showing me they know what I'm talking about. So, find them two other ways. I'm just asking you for to combine some things, because some people are paying attention and some people aren't. Be quick. I don't have much time to wait. Well, I don't have much time to wait. Now I have no time to wait. But we're not leaving without this, so I'll allow a volunteer. Owen would like to volunteer. Give me one of them. V squared over R. V squared over R is one of them. There's one more. Yes, sir? I squared times R. These are the three different ways you can calculate power consumption through a resistor. And you had three ways to calculate energy storage in a capacitor, right? You guys are seeing the similarities here, right? Hope so.